I want to uh, introduce our presenter, Susan Lane from New York today. Uh, Susan is a regular here at our club meetings monthly, and then also at our show. Bless her heart, she flies all the way from New York every year. And uh, we have a little secret that I pick up Susan usually, and we stop by Brahms ice cream and have a double dip of something in an ice cream cone. Welcome to Wichita, Susan, this October. Susan's both a collector and a dealer, and she tends to come early to the show, two or three days early, and she has her room open for collectors to come in and see maybe one, two, or three new postcard books that she's handling. And she brings them, uh, obviously, from the East Coast, and they're fresh and new, and we haven't usually seen them here in the Midwest. But we're happy to have her. And oh, yes, she brings along a couple boxes of special cards. We say that special. They really are a, a wide range. She knows her audience and brings special things for uh, collectors and friends. But thank you, Susan, for being here. And uh, we look forward uh, to hearing your presentation on early French postcards. Thank you, Susan. Go ahead. Al, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you everyone for being here and listening to me. I can talk about postcards in detail or in generalities. Postcards for me are the art history and culture that we have experienced or parents have experienced or further back. And I find so much information from them and I wanted to share one particular segment of postcards that uh, is referred to as the grand series of French postcards, uh, 1898 to 1906. Uh, there were earlier postcards, but this is a time when publishers were coming out with new ideas to gather momentum for the postcard collector and to show off their wares. Um, before I start showing you any pictures, I wanted to quickly talk about the concept of why it's called Grand Series, or at least why I think Nudan refers to it as Grand Series. When we talk about a set, it's very easy to understand that there's one publisher, one artist, and one theme that goes into two or more cards. Maybe the set has six, maybe 12, maybe more. But it's basically one artist's work and one theme. When we come to the idea of series, we have something a little different. It's one publisher, but one publisher has pulled together different artists in order to make a point, which is usually an advertising point. And I take New Dan's term grand series very seriously. Uh, the French are very well known for grand series the Russians, the Austrians, the Italians, the Japanese, most countries had a grand series during this time or slightly afterwards. So let's keep in mind as I go through, I know people will interchange the word set and series, but series to me seems to lead to different artists work put together. Years ago, I was, I, I started off collecting what I call poster art, images that looked like they could have been posters on the streets of France. And in fact, it turns out that many of them were, but more to the point, I was looking at poster art on the left side of a postcard. I was very specific about it. And I collected and I organized by date of acquisition. Well, that didn't go over as well as I thought because I had no rhyme or reason or direction. I looked carefully at my cards when I pulled them all out and looked at them. On some of the cards, I saw this circle stamped on the card, Sinos. And on the back of the card, it was printed Sinos. So I knew I had a lead there. Some of the cards had this palette with brushes and it read Garen. I had way fewer of these, but still it led me to believe that I could separate out some cards. 
and, and make something of it. And in fact, I started to look at Xenos. Now there isn't a lot written about any of these early cards, but enough for me to have a story to tell or at least put something together. When um, I can point to, um, well, Nudan of course mentions it, but one line phrases. And then uh, Bowers and Martin in their um, MUCA book talk about Sino's cards. So let's look at some of the cards. Next, please. This, the series contains 36 cards and it was first produced in 1889, which is pretty early for picture postcards after some of the souvenir cards that we might have seen earlier. Um, of 36 cards, five are devoted to Napoleon. Two, I believe, are by Grasset, and I'm only showing you four of them. But in 1889, you get the feeling that Napoleon was still a popular character and uh, he's well documented on postcards here. Of that set of 36, seven cards are by Charest. I don't know how many of you recognize this type of imagery, but Charest was incredible in terms of uh, showing the vibrance of theater and uh, what, whatever he did, there was a great deal of movement and, and vibrance. He also is the person who, he did not invent stone lithography. That was invented about a hundred years before, but he refined it in such a way that it became economical for these beautiful posters to be made. And when I say beautiful, it wasn't only the imagery, but the posters were about four feet by six feet. They were plastered over Paris. They were just breathtaking. And theater was one of his major themes. And uh, here you see one of the cards in that set. Anyone recognize this? This is also part of uh, the Cenos series. And I'll tell you who it is if you don't know, but to the right of the image at the bottom, Alan, could you point that out? The Cenos stamp is very visible. Sometimes the stamp is right in the image and hard to find, but this one shows you very clearly that it is stamped Cenos. This is by Toulouse-Lautrec and it's his first poster. And it's a dynamic poster and was very well received throughout Europe and put him on the map of being one of the finest uh, poster artists that we had at the time. Muku was also gaining acclaim at the time. And this is three of four cards within the series done of posters that Muka had produced. And they all show Sarah Bernhardt in different roles that uh, she partook in. And these are particularly beautiful cards, hard to find, but here you go, at least three of the four. The most difficult card in this series is the Waverly Cycles card. And um, Waverly was an American company, but here they are, uh, the distribution in Europe. And Muka has been asked to do a card for them. And this is quite a vibrant picture as well and was very well received. And if you're looking for the, it took me a long time to, to establish that this really was a Sinos card. Under, in the writing, Je suis at the beginning, you can see the uh, Sinos stamp right there. So I do know that it is one of the cards from the series. From the early writings, they indicated there were 35 cards to the set, but this card was added once it was discovered and 36 is the number for that set. Moving along to the next set. I mentioned the one with the artist pad, that's Guerin. In the Guerin series produced two years later in 1891, I have come to learn there are only 10 cards in the series, a small run. Most of the cards are advertising food and some cards, as I'll show you in the next card, are advertising uh, theater. But um, apparently Biscuit Perno used, used this company for uh, several 
posters and those posters were made in postcards. Here we have creme eclair and other product being advertised. This card is advertised as a theater event. And I think there are perhaps two that uh, show theater while the others, as I mentioned, were food products. Again, I ask you, does anyone recognize this image? It's another very famous image. On the left is a poster, on the right is the postcard. This is by Steinlin. And if anyone collects Steinlin postcards, they're used to seeing his work in uh, people on the streets of Paris. But whatever he did, he did magnificently. And this is another top card, surprisingly found in this series of Sinos. I had a hard time figuring out quite what Guerin or Sinos or what these companies were, but the poster on the left uh, was one of two posters shown by uh, Jack Renard, Renard in a recent uh, auction in the catalog. He mentions this poster and he refers to the top banner. This happens to be a very rare poster. The top banner has Guerin's name on it which assured me that Guerin and Sinos were probably the producers, the publishers and the printers of the card. Uh, Guerin had just bought the rights to this 1894 poster and he was showing off his work to show people who he represented and the quality of what his work was. So, take into account this is a very significant poster and not only is it in four by six which you might have a little trouble hanging in your living room or kitchen um the one on the right three and a half by five and a half it fits into my album just fine okay now we move on to collection to song and things get a little more complicated Collection de sang means collection of 100. Let me tell you first off, there are not 100 cards to the set. Um, there may be 98, which I think there are, or there may be 99, which if I remember, I'll explain to you why we even get to that number. I, Emil Graninger was an artist that only did according to the records, only did coloring of images. Because of his connections to the art world, he came up with the idea of producing Collection de Sang. He hired Grasset, another well-known artist, to do this cover. It's a, it's a pochette or an envelope that would fit around postcards. Each Collection de Sang is numbered by the series one to nine. Each set include, uh, is of a different color and a different flower. They're very charming uh, pieces of art in of themselves. <clears throat> they name 10 different artists. And you can see that on the uh, overprinting on the left. However, he promised a package every two weeks to his subscribers. Two years later, in 1903, the series was complete. The cards are numbered, at least one, two thirds of the cards are numbered. Some of the cards have the same number as another card in the set. Now, I don't know if it's large enough for you to read, but let's look at the center card. Uh, it reads Collection de Sant, e.g. Emile Graninger, Paris, and then a number at the top. Uh, this is a sample of some of the cards, a random sample, but what I like, um, to break down is how do we get to only nine series and 98 cards? Each package intent was to have 10 cards, but to his subscribers, he would slip in extra cards 
and number it the same number as another card, sometimes for the same artist, sometimes not. Um, the extra card usually had a little bit of a risque theme to it. And Alan, on the card on the left bottom, there's a nude, some nude figures there. Hey, nothing too risque, but it is risque. So it, when you see an extra card in a set, it was usually the risque one that was the additional or gift card. At least that's what's surmised up till now. Um, what else can I tell you about the cards? Some of them were beautiful. Some of them were mysterious, some rather bland, and some perhaps, oh yes, so there were several military ones. There was no number one in the set. Some people feel that number seven, which is a duplicate, one of them was meant to be number one, but it says seven, so it is seven. But these two cards, look at the card on the left, and if you know Alphonse Mucha's work, you wonder, how could this be signed Mucha? But this was probably the card set into the package and the card on the right was the gift card. It's a fairly well-known image, both are numbered 11. If a card became popular, he sometimes reprinted that card, but without the Banaline collection descent at the top. So I think that pretty much tells you everything I know about this set of uh, 98 cards. And why 98 or 99? Oh, one more thought. There's one card with a man fishing and his hook is in the water and what does he pull out? A young lady. A woman wearing a red bathing suit or in some cases, lightly colored, a woman wearing a red and white striped bathing suit. And I believe that's why some people will count it as 99 cards rather than 98. My guess, I don't know, but same card, I think the same colorist. Oh, longer story, job postcards. Job is the name of a cigarette paper company. And I know that many Americans will refer to it as Job, but in France and through most of the world, it's called Job. So you call it what you want, I'll know what you mean. Uh, tobacco was brought to, the, to Europe in the 1500s, well, late 1400s, and it soon became popular through pipe smoking, cigar smoking, and cigarettes. And um, when you smoked a cigarette, your tobacco was rolled in corn husks. Didn't smoke that well. So a baker in Pepignon in the uh, southwest corner of France in the Pyrenees came up with the idea of a strong paper made of well, a rice paper. He sized it and, and had it folded and packaged and he applied for a patent. But he was a baker and didn't really need another business of making paper for his cigarettes. But his two sons did come up with companies. One son, Joseph, produced Lanil or the Nile. Uh, cigarette company. Uh, both companies sell pretty much the same product, but under different names. Uh, Joseph used Capiello's elephant. And this is another poster that you might recognize. The uh, laughing elephant uh, is kind of strange for postcard for um, cigarette paper and lineal as well, but everything Egyptian was quite, quite popular right then. And the paper was said to be as strong as an elephant's hide. And hence, this is their iconic image. The other son produced uh, a company after his father's name, which is Jean Berdeau. The J and the B were linked in the center 
with a diamond shape that was replicated the crest of the town that they lived in. And the J star B put together was seen as job and that's how the name evolves over time. The company had a very interesting marketing scheme. They produced sets of, or series of cards. The first series they produced was in 1902. And they were primarily of exotic women, but not all of them. There's one chimney sweep in there and one uh, Turkish uh, gentleman sitting with a cigarette. The first series has this golden shaped uh, sunflower as their background image. And on the left is the portrait. Now, before they produced postcards, they produced calendars and posters. They took the same images and applied it to a postcard. And at the bottom of this postcard, you can see it tells you that this was a calendar in 1898 and the artist's name. The date on these cards do not indicate the date of publication of the postcard, but the date of the poster or calendar as it was produced. There were eight cards to this particular set. And if you look in Europe, you'll find them. In the United States, a little harder to find. This is the second series of cards that they produced and one of the most popular sets. Uh, it was produced in 1907 and there are probably 30 cards to the set. This is part of the same set, but I have to point out what marketing genius Alphonse Mucha was, if you didn't already know that. How many times do you see the name job in this card? All right, we, at the top, we see collection to job. At the above her head, you see another image of the word job. In her hand, she's holding pay, uh, the package of uh, cigarette papers. At her, below her knees, the insignia with the diamond. But there's one other thing that's very interesting. Look below her knees at the yellow background. There's an iconic image that is a trademark with the letters J-O-B. And it appears on the bottom and on the top in this image. And then it's replicated as the background to the writing section of the postcard. They're called tiles or lozenges or whatever they are. They, they serve the purpose of being a light background and also reminding you of what the product is job cigarette paper. I mentioned there were several series. This is the third series they produced um, in 1908 and uh, less popular, very difficult to find. And I don't know anyone who's really looking for them. I'm sorry for the clarity of it, but it, it, I couldn't find a more current image of it. So you get what you get. The fourth series, similar to the second series, but at the top, you'll see that the lettering is different. At top right, you have cigarette jo jo cigarettes job, which you didn't have on the earlier series, but it still has the tiles and the lozenges. So if you're going to collect job cards, you might want to stick to one series and go through it. This particular series probably has 32 cards. Two cards were identified in the last few years, uh, not, hardly smoking related, but nonetheless. And then last of this series. These two images appear on other cards, but in this format, the one with the floral arrangement around it is by <clears throat> a New Dan standards called the Grand Series of the Grand Series. It's a bigger image. It's a more colorful image. There's a little bit more handwork that's done to it. So this card becomes yet another set. And I believe there are only 30 cards to this set. They often used to be more pricey. Right now I see them all priced around the same. 
but these two image, images stand out. The mukha on the right and left have been produced over and over again as posters for many different occasions. Uh, and um, the Bowers Martin book will show you some of the different variations of that card. So there you have job. If you do uh, attempt to collect it, I've, I'm able to offer you um, <clears throat> a graph showing the different cards, when they were produced as calendars or posters and give a description along with the artist's name. And uh, we might be able to post that in the chat room or contact me if you're interested in this detail. I warn you, the last of my five series, my great series, beer is not an alcoholic beverage, unlike it's B-E-E-R namesake. This product produced in the 18, mid 1800s is a bittersweet aperitif reported to be a health tonic and was used to encourage your appetite. To advertise the committee or pulled together a contest or competition and they asked artists to please submit images for their use on postcards. It's reported there are 113 postcards, but I think there are more. I've just lost my notes somewhere in the last three or four years, so uh, I can't be accurate about that. But of the 113 cards, at least that number, here are the two first prize winners. Here are two of the second prize winners. And I believe there were only two, one first prize and two second prize. When we get to the third prize, next please, there may have been five or six postcards. And you'll see some very different imagery, some of men, some of women, some of, we'll get to animals, just very, very. This is fourth prize. Again, I'm showing you the difference in some of the artwork. There may have been about 30 of these. This is the fifth prize winner. And it's not so bad to be the fifth prize winner if you're in the leagues with the card on the right. That was done by Raphael Kirshner, another well-known artist of the time. And um, Again, all the cards were different, some comical, some serious, some glamorous and so forth. I can't tell the difference between a first prize and a fifth prize, nor can I really see the difference in cards that are placed at sixth place. So I show you five of them. Uh, more animals shown. I, I don't know that they're seriously drinking, but they are drinking. Here are two, the last of the ones that I'm going to show you. These are sixth place winners. They're as beautiful as many of the others. However, I think what put some of the cards into sixth place, and I'm not sure of this, but this is my opinion, um, there's no bottle showing the product. So it seems to me that all the cards without, uh, all the images without a bottle got kicked into sixth place. So if you're going to collect, there's over a hundred cards, have fun. And with that, that's all for me. I hope I didn't tire you. I hope I didn't scare you. I just hope you're out there trying to find beautiful cards. Thank you so much, Susan. What beautiful cards and i think we've seen them in catalogs and we've seen them for sale sometimes but uh, you know this is part of going to a postcard show being able to be uh, responsive to dealers who sell this sort of uh, wonderful card and to learn and to ask lots of questions and if you're lucky susan will be at that show wherever it is because she goes to a lot of shows besides just Wichita. But uh, 
Uh, she's the font of knowledge, and we really, really appreciate your uh, helping today, uh, Susan, and, and thank you. Bill Burton, I think we have some questions, don't we? Um, Clarissa has written in more of a statement than a question, but she says, do you know that the French are trying to create a new collection uh, de Sant, but with artists of the 21st century? Yeah, uh, I met I met the people when I was in Paris last time, and I do have one of the sets. They're trying hard. I don't know what will happen with the rest of it. They're very different than the early French cards. Um, and at some point, uh, I'll gladly show the ones that I have in, in series one. So uh, they're trying. I was hoping some of the dealers, the uh, dealers promoters, in the United States would do the same thing. Within our um, postcard friends population, there are many, many artists. And wouldn't it be a grand idea if uh, th their work was pulled together to produce an American series? So thank you for asking, Clar or to say, mentioning that, Clarissa. You know that they have more than two series done? Um, I don't know what's happened. I'm out of touch. Okay. COVID did me in, and I don't know if there's going to be another Paris show, so everything's on hold for me. Okay, a number of, of people have just written to say, uh, very nice, thank you for doing this, uh, beautiful cards, but no, no questions here. So maybe, Susan, could you, do you see any possibility at all of this uh, 21st century sock? Uh, happening or is it just hit or miss at this point of uh, a new series being produced yes i don't know of anyone who's trying to do it i know mary in um about two years two years two years ago gosh four years ago at a new york show i had advertised uh asking for students to submit work but there really just wasn't uh, a good response to it as far as i know um i it's not easy to do. Uh, in terms of one of the sets that I mentioned, he already knew these people and knew how to approach them. Um, my gosh, that could be a future project for you and for me. How about that? Well, you'd have to be the editor. I'll take care of the publishing part. <laughs> okay. Susan, why don't you explain to people what New Dan is? Because we use that reference and they need to know. There are many books that have come along that are superb on any topic. You have to pick your topic well before you know what book to look for. Uh, Ger Gerard Nudin was a publisher of um, Card Postal. He, every, he had an annual publication and uh, he would produce uh, books such as this one with artist names, topics. Some of the uh, uh, catalogs had views of different towns to give you an idea, a taste, and a price in French franc. So it, in terms of price, it's somewhat outdated. And uh, I speak a little French. I'm married to someone who speaks French fluently. So the fact that the book is in French does not bother me at all. It gives us a headway into European postcards. Uh, it gives you some thought, gives you some information, not a lot of information and not always correct information, but very close. So Nudan is one of the reference books that- uh, Susan, what years, what years that book? Um, the one that's most popular is 1991 for illustrators. This one is 1982, and I found it most helpful. And I see it's online for, uh, right now. The uh, 91 was selling for $100 at one point. This book I found more valuable than he, that. So. He published one every year until 2001, and he asked not to continue after his death. And he died. And he, and he died in 2001. And therefore, there was no more after that. Yeah, unfortunately, because it really is a great reference. 
Do you have uh, several of the catalogs or all oh, of them? I have, I have like 20 of them or something like that. Yeah, I bought someone's <laughs> I was, collection. I was, I was buying them every year. Um, at one point, and then I stopped because I stopped dealing with postcard for a while professionally because of my job. Mm. And I bought the last two just for suing your sake. <laughs> uh, I guess I come to postcards a little too late to have been looking seriously at postcards when he was producing these, mm. but, um, but I'm glad I found him. Uh, I think we have wonderful reference material. It's just that you have to pick through so many of them. Um, I, was I, think, I think that that was, I think is the biggest catalog that ever was produced. There are other catalogs from Italy and other places that I also have, but that one was the most that every year will come out. Really dense. Yeah, he touched on uh, many countries, but none as well as he did for uh, France. Yeah. So he knew he was, did, was he stopping. Did a, Susan did a nice job, of, you know, including the whole world. I would get my copy every year and then just go through it page by page. And anything that was a topic that I collected, you know, it gave you usually the artist's name, and then you could track down that artist and write him. This is all before the internet, but I had letters going back and forth and good associations. And, you know, if you just write a brief letter and show what you're interested in, it's amazing. Their, their kids or somebody down the block will know how to uh, speak and write English. And so it just was... Uh, a marvelous time that uh, I uh, participated. He certainly knew about Rick Gary's work. Almost every time mm -hmm. there would be one or two Rick Gary postcards in the New Dan. He and, did uh, not stop at antique postcards. He oh, included no. modern postcards very uh, right. aggressively. Yes, right. yes. And Good it point. was a big thing. And one year, I can't remember, I think it might have been in the 70s or 80s, we had modern postcards as a show theme. And I'll, I'll, I could make a program out of that sometime and maybe I will and when I'm in a tough spot, but we had great response. Uh, it was just different. And, uh, but that's what we were trying to do to be different and to, uh, you know, have something. But uh, back in the 70s, I, I think that's a good idea for a program sometime, but I'll show you all of them. Here's a comment from Katie Clark uh, asking, are there any libraries that have collections of these catalogs? Uh, I haven't looked into it, but if you go to your local library and ask them for the book, they may find it in another state and uh, get it back to you. So um, again, don't be afraid and don't expect too much. It takes a while before you become familiar with what he's offering you, but do try. Okay, but, In, any other questions? Yes, Clarissa. Um, the French are re very much into modern postcards. They have two magazines that one especially dedicated only to the, to the modern postcards, which I have issues and they are a glossy magazine with a lot of picture where you can find modern postcard. And the other one is also, it has more a mixture, not only, but there is a lot of modern postcard. Yeah. At, Great, the, postcard show, at the postcard show in Paris, the magazine representative will show up. And also they will have an artist or two, a modern artist or two selling their cards. And they really <clears throat> are producing modern cards. For, I don't know if it's in particular shops or how they're marketing it, but uh, they're to be had. If only we could get back <laughs> to a Paris show. <laughs> Job, I think you yes. had a question, please. Yes. Yes, I do. I, I was just curious. I guess I typed it into the wrong spot there. <laughs> but you were showing that one card um, that you said was kind of on the risque side. And I, it, to me, when I was looking at that, it reminded me of a uh, uh, kind of a, 
whimsical map of uh, Europe, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if anybody else noticed that. I did, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, that's exactly <laughs> what it was. But uh, why I picked that one out, I picked it out before I thought of why I wanted to, to mention the gift card. And uh, I, I have my book here, I can pull out others. Some, it was just a pretty woman, a little bit alluring. Some, it was someone with a half strap off their shoulder. But here it was a very obvious uh, undressed character. And it's, it's interesting, the only part of Europe that is not risque is the Levant. Uh, <laughs> that's, it's, it, the, it's the, I think it's a shepherd <coughs> boy or something. Uh, he's sitting there, he's on the right-hand side of the car. The rest of Europe, is I guess what you'd call risque, but the Levant, that section, yeah. which is Bulgaria, uh, uh, a bit of Hungary and all, is, is this kid with a, I, I think a, a shepherd. We're gonna have to ask the artist what his intent was. What, what was on the mind there? <laughs> Kyle, Kyle Jolliffe has a, a direct question. Um, I, I, I don't, I guess my question would be is, um, what are the what's the pricing on these cards in the United States? Or not? All right, um, I'd have to go over them individually, but let me say number one, most of them are hard to find in the United States. Not impossible, but hard to find. If you go online, they're easier to find on Del Camp than they are to find on eBay. Uh, some of the pricing in the United States I find bizarre. Within a set, a series rather, um, some cards could be 25, 30, and some could be 80. Uh, the MUCA cards, you would expect them to be more. Um, uh, the Waverly did, Bicycle, didn't it set? In the Waverly, oh. Couple, yeah, several thousand dollars. If you, but you can't find that card. I, um, I'm not sure. I've seen two pictures of it. Someone else said there were two identical, identical cards. Well, I think there's at least four because someone saw two and someone saw two. Uh, they're probably several thousand dollars. The um, Lautrec one is probably over a thousand dollars. But the Napoleon ones, you can find them for some of them for $20, $25. Uh, and then a 20% discount in person. And I have to say, people who don't know their cards might put them under random poster art and not know nor care because they paid a dollar for it and they're happy to get $10 for it. So Kyle, no one answered, but if you see any of my cards, call me <laughs> and we'll negotiate. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I do see some similar cards come up in my own collecting of New York's early New York City restaurants where there's a, a French restaurant. Mm. Um, you know, there's some lovely scenes of um, the Cathedral Notre Dame and, and early, early French airplanes um, flying over the, the countryside. The, the Cafe Martin series has a lot of cards by Belgium artists that are, are similar. Yeah, and New Yorkers. There are several New Yorkers who collect Cafe Martin, so that brings it up. But it's it, in general, it's not a very expensive card. It yeah. uh, it's not a two dollar card. It's not a five dollar card. But uh, but it's supply and demand. How many cards can we find? How many dealers know what what how much in demand that card is? And is it only New Yorkers? Well, obviously not. You don't live but eight hours away, nine hours away from New York. So you're still interested in New York cards. So the demand is there from you and from others who live more locally. Yes, for sure. Thank you. So, Thanks, Kyle. Round number. May I ask an off topic question? Please do. Yes, right. I'll go to the museum with you. <laughs> oh, well, that too. No. Um, I'm still doing research on Hotelite postcards and I came across a um, term that I'd never heard of and it's called a slide transparency postcard. And when I looked up, tried to do some research, 
slides were not invented until 1935, 36. So I, wondered if anyone had ever heard that term before. Um, it was in an article by a lady named Otter. Oh, I can't find her name now. Um, but I'd never heard that term before. And so far, neither has anyone else. Damaris, is it slide, S-L-I-D-E? Yes. It's and it, the description says that it's a slide put between two pieces of cardboard and it's a hold to light slide transparency postcard. There are different types of mechanical cards and some with like a, a cage design on top of it. Yeah, I mean, it, we, you and I had corresponded about this. Yeah. But just, I've never heard the term. Yeah, new to me too. But I have a slide, so I thought I'd try to make one. <laughs> Could that have been a patented name, a product name, maybe? I'm sorry. Could that um, could that slide that name possibly been a patented name from a company that developed it, and so you don't see it? It would have to have been Kodak. Um, let me see if I can find so many. Stuff here. Ugh. On the Metro postcard website, with all the definitions they have, there's a transparency postcard description there without the word slide in it. It just says it's a transparency, almost what you just said. A transparency postcard is a rare type of hold to light card where an entire sheet of transparent film is sealed between two pieces of die cut paper. When held up to light, the transparency does not just add color to the printed image, but provides for an entirely new picture. Did maybe Alan provide a picture? That, that might be the hold to light. Maybe that's a hold to light postcard. Maybe that's different. It's a hold to light transparency postcard. Where is that? I get a stack of things here. Well, the hold to light I'll postcard. I'll have to save that the question the for another time. When you hold them up to the light, a backlit, another image yeah. appears on them. Yeah, I have about five hundred of them. Okay, well, that's different maybe than what you're talking about. Well, those um, are usually die cut too. A lot of them are die cut, and some of them are transparencies where you don't really see anything until you hold it up to the light, and then there's, there's a white space on. Mostly, there's a white space on the postcard, and when you hold it up to the light, the the um, transparency comes through. But this was called a slide transparency postcard. But anyway, obviously, no one has ever heard of it either. Uh, hello, this is um, Norman Ball from Toronto. Okay. Uh, as regards the word slide, it was used in the 19th century uh, for magic lantern slides. That these are glass slides many colors, some of them were black and white. You would put it in a magic lantern that had a bright light behind it and it would project it on the screen. So the term slide is uh, in use before Kodak. It's in use before the 20th century. Thank you, thank you. Okay, the article was written by Zoe Orcutt, O-R-C-U-T-T. -T. Writer. And it um, says a slide transparency postcards are, as the name implies, a slide transparency sandwiched between two layers of a postcard. These are rare and hard to find, obviously. I can't find anything. Where did she publish that article? Um, University of Akron. Oh. As, a, as a book? Um, it just says idea exchange at the University of Akron. Writer, emailer, call her up. Or ask Elaine Luck to call her up. She's right an over there. <laughs> okay, any other things? Any other questions or comments from anybody? Thank you, Susan, very, very much for yes, thank, you, Susan. Today. Thank, you. thank you, Susan. 
Our show is on the October 15, 16, and 17. And our next meeting, it will be on September 4. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Kyle Joliffe will be our speaker that time. Be sure to be watching for Phil McDaniel's club newsletter. Man, this one that we got on last Thursday is just really, really strong. Wonderful articles by John Taylor and by our friend Hugh Cox in California and lots of information. And you'll see the big green elephant that uh, talked about the uh, cigarette papers being as strong as an elephant hide. Thank you, Susan, again. That's all for today, folks. And thanks a million. And we'll see you next month, I hope.